Hey, this is John Lee Dumas of EO Fire, and welcome to Master Leadership. Great leaders ask great questions, and this podcast takes you on a journey to master leadership with questions that matter to leaders who matter with your host, Lily Sinabria. Hi, this is Lily, and welcome to Master Leadership Through Crisis series, where we will connect with leaders worldwide to gain insights on important questions to help us navigate through rough waters. If you would like to participate as a guest, or if you have a question that you would like to ask a guest, go to masterleadership.org for more information. Learn about Matt Sweetwood after this brief message. Discover the anti-budgeting CPA's surprising financial freedom formula for small business owners. As fast as money comes in, it goes right back out. Make solid money decisions and create a positive cash flow. Start with these 25 tips to making and keeping more money available from Maddie Brown, CPA at SmashingNumbers.com. Matt Sweetwood is the CEO and co-founder of Insurious, the insurance platform that protects your most valued gear and equipment. He is an internationally known professional speaker, author, and consultant. With over 30 years of entrepreneurial experience, Matt has been credited with the reinvention of the modern camera store. However, his greatest achievement is having raised five successful children to adulthood as a single dad. He is a frequent national TV and publication contributor and has a number one best-selling book, Leader of the Pack, How a Single Dad of Five Led His Kids, His Business, and Himself from Disaster to Success. Welcome, Matthew Sweetwood. How are you? I am doing great today, enjoying the lovely Miami weather. Oh, I'm envious. I'm in New York. Even though it's beautiful, I just don't have water around me anywhere. Yeah, I lived in New York until last July for the five years before that, and then New Jersey for the 50 years before that. So I am completely familiar with that area. I look maybe pretty smart for leaving New York when I did, (laughs) because it's pretty rough there right now. But I love living in New York. Oh, I miss good. it. Well, you did the typical migration pattern of New York to Florida. Yes, There's a lot of New I Yorkers mean, there, right? Yeah. The yeah. whole place is New Yorker and New Jersey. Yeah. That's it. Everybody yeah. you run into. Oh, They're nice. either from Latin America or New York and New Jersey. That's the entire <laughs> mix here. We can get a bagel and pizza uh, here. That's what it really is. A New York bagel and a New York pizza. It's actually there. not. <laughs> no? No. Sorry. I you would have to take not a trip. be telling you the truth. All right. It may be worth the trip back. Right. Eventually, so, right? Maybe yeah. not right now. But, uh, <laughs> well, Matthew, we're so happy to have yeah. you on our podcast. Are you ready to pour into our listeners? I am ready. Awesome. So, Matthew, tell us a bit about your path to leadership and what you're doing now. Um, I'll start with what I'm doing right now. So, today, I am the CEO of a company called Lux Now. Lux being the combination of Lux and Now. We are a marketplace for luxury autos, homes, and yachts. If you just think about Airbnb for luxury, but we also have exotic autos, luxury autos, and yachts, we're the only company that I know of that features all three luxury items on their platform. We have hosts on our platform that come and obviously place their inventory and people that come in and rent. We have very, very good tech. We're late state startup. We're post revenue. We have almost a billion dollars worth of inventory on our platform right now. And we're in Miami, New York, and Los Angeles, and have just opened up Mykonos, Greece, and Havana, Cuba. So we're really excited about having the next big thing in the startup world. You can simply go to our website, luxnow.com, download our app, app is Luxnow, and you'll see that it's a really exciting and fun to use app, easy to use, it provides luxury in a convenient way. So. That is what I am doing now, which is an unusual thing for me because it's a startup and I ran a more traditional brick and mortar business for many, many years in New Jersey. And that's kind of where my business started after I left graduate school back in the day when you used to ride a horse and buggy to school. Um, (laughs) After my graduate school, I started working in a company. We were a small 
photographic supply company. When I walked in, the company was doing about a million dollars a year. When I left the company in 2015, I think it was, we were a hundred million dollar company. So I get to tell a leadership story of growing a company from 1 million to a hundred million. It took quite a bit of time. There were many, many reinventions along the way there and things to do to survive that process. But it was a great journey, a learning journey, I sharpened my business skills there and really had a very, very good run. When I left, I think we had a hundred and something people in the company, loved them all. I did really well. I was in the photographic industry and that's a very challenged industry, which is why we had to reinvent it so many times. Mm. You know, digital technology and marketplace changes from the internet and Amazon and so on. And then I left there and went out and decided to do something different. We ended up opening a big retail store. I get kind of credit for reinventing the camera store model. Essentially, every camera store that operates today operates off kind of my reinvention of that. And I went out into the world, wrote a best-selling book, Leader of the Pack. What I'm most proud of, you know, I'm sure if you've written a book, you know it's not a money-making endeavor. It's sitting right there. I have a copy over my shoulder right there. And what I really like is I weekly get comments from people that it helps them in their lives. It saved them. It's gotten them out of difficult relationships. It's given them motivation in business. So I'm very proud of how much it's helped people. I did some consulting for a while. And then I made my way down here to Florida and ended up at LuxNow. So that's kind of my journey. In the middle there, I had another leadership journey, which I like to talk about, which is my leadership journey as a parent. So part of the story in my book talks about how I became a single dad of five. And I ended up being the sole parent of five little children and ended up raising them into uh, productive human beings, which of course is what I am most proud of because being a parent is being a leader. So that's basically my story that got me to here. And there is definitely a reason why I have no hair. <laughs> wow. So there's so many questions here, but one of the things that comes up for me, leader of the pack. At first, when you were talking about your organizations, that's what I was thinking of. But now I'm thinking about you as a parent, right? Is, yeah. is that what your overall message is? Of course. So that's why a pack, right? You sort of walked right into my little double on time there. But of course, I was a leader of a pack at work. And I think some of the most successful articles that I've written talk about, you know, the relationship between being a competent parent and being a competent leader. The skill set that allows you to be good at both or accomplish something at both, they're very much connected. Mm -hmm. I want to say as a parent, my book is not a parenting book. In fact, my book is about all of the incredibly stupid things I did in my life and how somehow I survived over them. And the so book. did they, and they're yeah. doing well. Right, yeah, I, but that has nothing to do with me. The only thing that I'm credited for is that I was present, okay? I somehow came to the same home with my five kids and through some divine intervention, they all turned out really amazing, all went to top colleges, all way smarter than me, all <laughs> way more successful for me. And for those of you out there who have children, the most important thing is that they're all financially on their own, right? So none of them are on the payroll anymore. So to me, that is the victory. That's a victory, correct. Well, thank you so much for sharing. Now, where can we get your book? You can go to my website, which is msweetwood.com, M-S-W-E-E-T-W-O-O-D.com, or simply go to Amazon and do Leader of the Pack, and you will definitely find it. It has 135 star reviews. It was a number one seller in self-help books. So like I said, I'm very proud of the book. So you've had a very interesting leadership journey filled with many pivots. So many. as a leader... What advice would you give someone who's just starting out in leadership? I'm going to start out with the big one, which is just want it badly enough. Simple as that. Mm -hmm. Don't go into starting up a business or starting in anything unless you really mean to finish with success. It's a simple idea. It sounds a little bit like a meme. But you have to want things badly enough because you are going to face difficulties. You're going to face obstacles. You're going to face competitors. You're going to face the government. You're going to face whatever obstacles come your way. You're going to be tired. You're going to be all of those things. You just got to want it. And if you want something badly enough, you tend to do the things necessary in order to get there. For me, I wanted my kids to be successful. 
I wanted my business to be successful. And I didn't want to be a failure because for me, I'm sort of constructed that way. Failure is not an option. And so I was willing to do so. So that's really the first tip is understand the commitment that is going to be involved in bringing something to success. Other than out of movies, I don't know anybody who's gone into business and just boom, they're rich and successful the next day. Everybody always has war stories. So that's the first advice, you know, and be willing to put in the hours. I think the other advice I would give is to ask advice. It used to be much harder finding people to reach out to or you would try to hire a consultant maybe if you could afford it. But today, the resources out there to connect with people and ask for advice are just plentiful. So that really is very, very strong advice for people is to go find yourself a mentor, go find yourself a coach you can trust and really try and seek advice from them. So speaking of advice, what yeah. quotes or advice has helped you most during crisis? I think it's really a belief in higher power, in sort of the concept of I even use this today. In other words, I've made it to this point. God got me to here. I still have clothes on my back, a home to live in, and food on the table. And no matter what happens, we're going to eventually get through it. You know, this too will pass. But still knowing that if I want it badly enough, I'm going to make it pass, right? I'm going to somehow figure out how to do that. And that's a little bit of gaining belief in yourself, belief in God, belief in your own courage. And I think eventually you build, it's like a muscle, like anything else is that you're faced with incredibly difficult circumstances. I, for example, had five little children. They were ages 18 months to eight years old when I became wow. a single parent. So I had one in diapers. I had a business that was collapsing. I was out of shape myself. I was 300 pounds. And, you know, it was a really low time for me. But I wanted to succeed. I wanted to fix it. And you just sort of gain strength. You do one thing. And then the next thing, and the next thing, and the next thing. And that's really another tip that I would give is that whatever set of problems you have, just doing nothing never gets it done, of course. And even if something seems insurmountable, I think attacking one step at a time is always a good method because eventually you complete all the steps. Eventually you overcome all the things. So kind of go at it. I mean, in my case, you know, I sat there with my kids and you just say, okay, what do I do? You know, after I got through feeling sorry for myself and all the anger and all of those other things that went on, I eventually said, okay, you know, I need to fix this. So let's fix it one thing at a time. You know, the kids not brushing their teeth at night when they're going to bed, let's get them to brush their teeth. I know that sounds ridiculous, but okay, you got five little kids running around. And then when you do that, you realize they're doing that every night. Wow, that's a victory, right? Similarly at work, you know, we have a problem at work where, you know, the marketplace changed on us. You know, the small stores we were selling at one time back in the 90s, started going out of business. What do we do? Okay, well, we start to look at that problem. How do we fix it? How do we reinvent? Okay, let's fix this. And you start to move and eventually you solve the problems. Mm -hmm. And I think all of life works that way, is that when we look at problems in their individual units, individual pieces, we tend to find solutions, particularly if you just want it badly enough and you're willing to put in the work and the dedication and the thought to get through it. Right. So you not only have a vision, you also take action. And you also remember that this too shall pass. And that's great advice. Those are great things to live by and to reset every day. So thank you so much. Now, Matt, many use the term lifelong learner. What does that mean to you? And what are you learning right now? I think that a lifelong learner to me means that you have the ability to improve no matter what level you're at. So I've had the good fortune of running companies my whole life. So I've always been kind of at the top of the business pyramid. And even as a single parent, there's one thing cool about being a single parent. If we decide that on Sunday we're going to a football game, we're going to a football game. You know, we don't have to go, you know, have a picnic in the park because there was no mom there. So I always got to be in that position. But it doesn't mean that I can't get better. So as a lifelong learner, I think I'm going to apply some really good advice I actually read in a book called Relentless, a pretty popular book. He said in there that you look at your staff and the goal with your staff is the following. Never ever go to their level. So if you have a staff that's not performing, never sort of say, that's okay, I'm going to work at their level. You try your hardest to bring them to your level. But this is for you now. When you bring them to your level, then raise your level. 
So no matter where you are at, there is always a place where you can be better. Mm, and to yes. use a term from the book, I get called a closer a lot. And what a closer means is that no matter where I am, I'm already moving on to the next thing to try to improve and try to do something better. Like I said, I've been running companies for 30, 40 years now, and I still know that there are places that I can improve and learn to be better. And I actually try every day to do that. When you've been doing it long enough, you become one with your weaknesses, not even your strengths, your weaknesses. And you try to focus on those things and try to improve. Mm -hmm. I know, for example, with myself, I have a little bit of weakness when it comes to people. I'm a little bit too nice to people sometimes. Now, I know that sounds just terrible when I say that, but ultimately, Sometimes when you're too nice to people, you enable bad behavior or you allow people to underperform. And so a lot of times I find for me, that's always a challenge. And I always try to improve in that area and self-talk and research and ask for advice because I know that's an area that, you know, I struggle in. And even the areas where I excel in, which are operations and efficiency and marketing, I'm still looking to even raise my bar there. So I look at every aspect of what I do and I am always trying to get better at it. It's as simple as that. That's what a lifelong learner means to me. It's just getting better and better. I guess for some people it can mean learning new things, but I think sometimes while that's fun, I think just becoming expert, and this is a really important advice. I'm channeling my mother from many, many years ago when she used to say jack of all trades and master of none. Of none. Yes. You know, this is like, like one of the oldest cliches of all time, but it's a really good one. And I try to apply that to myself. So sometimes while it's very tempting to try all sorts of things and do things, and you do want to explore a little bit, sometimes just really perfecting what you're good at and perfecting what you do and keep improving, improving, improving is likely to lead you to success. Hey leaders, stay tuned for the rest of the interview following this brief message. Do you get headaches or don't feel quite right after a glass or two of wine? Well, you're not alone. I recently discovered organic, clean-crafted wines that are a game-changer for me. Scout & Cellar has a clean-crafted commitment to ensure that they produce wines without synthetic chemicals as they take care of the earth in the process. I can now enjoy wine without any adverse effects. Visit scoutandcellar.com forward slash Lily. That's S-C-O-U-T-A-N-D-C-E-L-L-A-R dot com forward slash L-I-L-Y and learn more about these delicious wines. You'll be glad you did. Great leaders deserve great wines. And so, you know, I do want to talk about this because we have experienced the COVID-19 crisis and currently in the U.S. we're being faced with racism in this country and the history of racism in this country. What are you learning now about this? I mean, so those are two, those are two big topics. Mm -hmm. So I'll address the COVID topic first. For me, the COVID topic is just another crisis. If you read my book, Leader of the Pack, you'll see that on a personal basis, I faced things which were more challenging than COVID. I'm not trying to minimize people who are suffering. I'm, I've been very blessed. None of the people that I'm close to, you know, have been affected by it and so on, but it's affected my business. It has greatly impacted my business. I'm conducting this interview with you from my home office, which I had to build because, you know, we had to obviously right. leave our existing offices for a period of time, but I was prepared for it. I applied that this too shall pass. And something that I always advise people in crisis is do not sit, anticipate. And so when they started talking about we might close this down, we, I like might, I'm not taking a chance on this. I immediately moved my staff home. We immediately set our tech up, our weekly meetings. I made believe like we were going to operate from home forever. And sure enough, I was two, three weeks ahead of everybody. All of a sudden you did that. Everybody was scrambling. Everybody already knew how to use Zoom. They had all their computers set up, our phones. We have these IP phones. They were all from the homes. We were all just operating. So that anticipation in a crisis is really crucial. You know, and I always give personal advice to everybody. Don't make believe like this is not happening. It's happening. You know, cut your expenses. Be smart. Figure out how to rechange your exercise routine. Take proactive steps. And once again, for me, I'm so used to being in crisis. It almost, I hate to say, right, it right. almost feels natural to me. You hear my voice, right? I'm really like on top of it. I don't sit there depressed. 
it isn't fair. I'm mad at China for doing this. I'm mad at this person. They didn't react right. Those are excuses. We all face these things. We all have this issue. And you just do whatever it is, you know, and you try to get through it and you try to make yourself and put yourself in a position when you get through. In terms of racism and so on, this is an issue that's actually a very, very difficult issue to talk about. Mm-hmm. And I'm just going to sort of come at it from a sort of a sideway because I'm not really an authority on this. What I will say is that I am a believer in personal responsibility. And what I mean by that is that if you face obstacles in life, right. be it racism, be it discrimination because you're a woman or because you are a single father and people People have perceived notions about the capabilities of single fathers. People have perceptions about the reason why a mother would leave their children and you face disadvantage because of that. It's very, very easy to make excuses, to scapegoat, to blame other people. I come from a place where I take full responsibility for my situation. I could sit there and say, I married a woman who did this to my kids and did this, but it's my fault. I chose to marry her. I chose to be in this circumstance. I chose to have five kids. I chose to have a business in the electronics industry. I chose to live in New Jersey, which has a vicious court system that really takes, really is very punishing to men in divorce. I can go through all the things that I can complain about. The state went after me. I fought a lawsuit against the state of New Jersey and won in the Supreme Court. They cost me crazy money. They humiliated me. They did all sorts of things. They used me. I can, you want me to hear me bitch about that? I can complain. I can say, it was too much for me. I can't succeed. But I believe in personal responsibility. I believe that no matter what life throws you, you figure out a way to overcome it. I think God does that to us. I think this is God's plan. I think God gives everybody challenges. Some people more, some people less. What about a person who is born with a disability? They have so many things to overcome. I just look at like Stephen Hawking, right? Oh my God. I mean, could have he had a bigger disadvantage and he turned out to be one of the greatest physicists to ever live. So my answer to that question is, I don't like to get into this sort of, this happened to us and my peoples and all of this. And when I speak to people, I'm like, okay, That happened. I'm sorry. This is really a terrible circumstance. But now what are you going to do? Let me just ask you a question. Do you believe that there is a systemic problem of racism in this country? I actually don't know. I can't really answer that. So can I, as a leader to a leader, encourage you to educate yourself on it? Because I've had to do that too, Matt. You're coming from a perspective and you're speaking from your own personal experiences and you have a very strong perspective and you have some valid points in what you're saying. However, Mm -hmm. there's also so much that I didn't know. And I've come from a challenging background too. And I've had to do a lot to take responsibility for my own life. I get that. But I want to encourage you to educate yourself a little bit more about the history and the systemic issues that as a white person and as someone who's Latina. Oh, 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 wait, I'm going to correct you because you called me a white man. I'm not really a white man. I'm Jewish. I'm Jewish. It's it's different. And I made assumptions there, see? And thank you for correcting me. (laughs) Okay. Um, You have to remember, I'm from New Jersey. Yeah. We don't get offended. We're unoffendable. I mean, you'd have to have a bigger baseball bat than I have in order to offend me. Right. So I'm just asking you to read up on it about the strong systemic strongholds that I'm really starting to see. And so the way to approach this and to see it through different lens is a way to go really for leadership. Because if we're not hearing the cries, if we're not hearing the whys, then that's our responsibility as leaders. I hear hear the cries cries of everybody. I have a lot of empathy for people who have suffered in their lives. I've suffered myself in my life. I'm just here to say, as leaders, there's a lot that we can still learn. That's there is a- always something we can yes. learn. Yes. We just went through that, you know, right. where, look, I've led companies to success and exited them and did all of this stuff. And I'm telling you, right. I have plenty to learn, even as a businessman. Fantastic. Okay. So when you think of leadership today, Matt, mm-hmm. what most concerns you? And what are you most hopeful about? For me, in terms of leadership, I would say that 
you know, I'm going to sort of take off on the point that you just made. The way life works, the way human history has worked, is low points are just that. And I think that in this country, we're at a low point. And that tells me that it's probably only up from here. Because of all the discussions that are going on, there will definitely be change or positive change. Maybe some will be negative, but mostly positive out of all of the things that are going on. And so, well, a lot of people, you know, they do these polls that say people think the country's headed in the wrong direction, whatever, you know, there's all these polls, which right now, because there's a lot of conflict, people, they're depressed as a society. But I actually view this as a little bit of a low point. So I'm very optimistic that we're going to actually continue upward from here. I think that, you know, this 2020, you know, you've seen the memes where they show all sorts of, can we pass on the year? Can I get off the 2020 train? You know, you've seen all of these things. But that just tells me that life and culture and the world ebb and flow. And right now we're at a low point. And so I anticipate that things will correct themselves, whatever that means, and we'll we'll pull out. So I'm quite optimistic about the future. And what are you concerned about? I think that we're in a period now where the focus is on people. And as a leader, I want to get better and I want to understand how to deal with people, particularly within my company, better going forward. You know, you go back to the turn of the century where, you know, people were locked into sweatshops. That's it. Right. One end kind of the spectrum. And I think we're moving really into the point where people are going to be the focus. And that's really where if you want to run a successful organization, you're going to focus a lot of your energies and so on and how to actually run a company and keep your staff in a way that's productive for them as human beings right. and still make profit and run the company right. and do all of those things, right. obviously. And, you know, I think that's something that millennials have really brought to light for us, because at one point it was all about productivity. And now millennials have kind of changed that narrative for us. So intergenerationally, we can learn from each other. So I don't think that millennials changed it. I think that they accelerated the momentum. It was going in that direction anyway. I mean, even if you look from programs that are in place that could be for the millennials, you know, sort of came about. A lot of the programs in the employee workplace look completely different 10 years ago even than they did 20 and 30 years ago. So the momentum was going in that place and they were smart Mm -hmm. enough for their own generation to say, hey, we want to have a better life, particularly in the workplace. And it benefits the older generation. Well, you know, I actually got called a perennial. Perennial? A perennial. (laughs) Like like the flower, right? (laughs) Meaning that I do things that are multi- generational. In other words, I have qualities in me like a baby boomer. I have qualities in me like a Gen X. I have qualities in me like a millennial. I'm the tech person in my company. I'm a tech whiz. Not to give my praise and self praise is no praise. Like I'm the networking guy. I fix all the networks. I know how tech works. I'm a social media influencer. Go Max. You know, I'm a writer. I have friends that are millennials. I have friends that are elderly. I have friends that are my own age. I sort of like do well in and out of these things. And someone wrote an article and said, there's a group of people like me that are actually called perennials. Perennials. You know what I was thinking? You know that funny commercial, the most interesting man in the world. That's you, Matt. Oh my God. I just got the, I just got, wait, I, I, I'm, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to edit this video. I'm just going to take that little five second clip out there. That's like the most amazing compliment ever. That's it. That's right. I'm going to start making those memes with myself. You know how it goes. Okay. So you have an option here. You can either respond to a question from a former guest, or you can share one challenge or struggle or failure that you learned from. Yeah, so I'm going to share a lesson of failure. And I think this is a very, very important lesson for everybody. And that lesson of failure is my success in many cases was held back or I found failure because of the people I associated with. I didn't carefully choose who my friends, who my relationships were, and even in some cases who my employees were. And since we're dating ourselves, you know, there's a cliche, you can measure a man slash woman by their friends. 
Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. I wrote an article about a year or two back, it actually got featured on the Thought Catalog, where it has about 30,000 shares, where it says, if somebody you're associated with does any one of the following 10 things, eliminate them from your life. It's a really harsh article. It's like mean, I admit it. The article is totally mean, but it is extremely instructional for success. Obviously, you don't need to take the things I said to the extreme. But I just basically said stuff like, if you're around a person and they make you feel bad about yourself more than once or twice, get rid of them. Nobody should be making you feel bad about yourself. If you're around somebody who isn't honest with other people, get them out of your life. If they continually take from you, they don't have a two-way relationship with them. And remember, this applies to personal relationships and business relationships. These people are bad karma. They bring bad luck onto you. They drain from you. They take you away from good relationships. So I think to me, that's almost like the most sage of advice as we go through this world, is pick your relationships wisely, both business and personal, and you'll avoid failure. In my case, marrying the wrong person, Right. And I'm not saying this with bitterness. And this is not the way I'm saying, it. you know, I don't want to sound like I'm like this divorce guy and my mm -hmm. wife is that that's not what I mean. I'm just talking very intellectually now, you know, marrying the wrong person ended up with my children without a mother. Right. Ended up with me in bankruptcy, ended up with me in the wrong place. Having the wrong employees prevented my business from going the wrong place. Having the wrong friends puts you in the wrong crowd. So I think for me, that lesson of failure puts me in a situation where I extremely carefully pick the people that I allow close to me and around me and in my company. So what kind of people should you have in your inner circle? I actually use a pretty simple measure. I try to have kind people in my company and around me. If you're not kind, you can't be there because kindness is the, as sort of at the top of the pyramid of a lot of other qualities. Kind people don't do a whole assortment of things which are unacceptable. Mm -hmm. So I think that when I look at somebody, if they're not a kind person, I keep away. I actually use that when I hire people for the company. I actually had given a keynote speech at an employment conference and I was on this panel and they said, you can't say honesty or hardworking because we know that those are, everybody wants employees that are honest and hardworking. Pick the most important quality, you know, everybody said this and that. And they came to me and I said, kindness. I only want to hire kind people. It actually got the biggest reaction. Right. And I explained why. Because when you have kind people, they interact with other people better. They increase morale. They create that better workplace. They create a better interaction, more productivity. It's just everything that goes with it than mean people or cruel people or selfish people and all of those things. So how do you live in kindness daily? I live by a simple principle. Every single person that interacts with me needs to leave that interaction better off than when they entered it. And if you just take that approach by every single human being that you approach, you'll be a kind person. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Now, Matt, as a listener of this podcast, what is a question that you would like a future leadership guest to respond to? For me, it's the question I ask, actually, is the how did you do it? What is your biggest success? And what is the most important factor that allowed you to achieve that success? You get some really cool answers when you ask those people. Is there anything else you want to share with our listeners? Yes. I love when I come on shows like this to hear from your listeners. I'm a very open person. I love communicating with people msweetwood.com, where we mentioned before, where you can find my Leader of the Pack book. My Twitter is at msweetwood, my LinkedIn, msweetwood, Facebook, msweetwood, Instagram. Reach out to me on one of those platforms. Tell me how stupid I was out here, or why I'm wrong, or why I'm right, or any of those things, and I'm glad to talk to you. And you will certainly engage in kindness like you have, and that's who you are. And I want to thank you so much for adding value to me and to our listeners. It's been my pleasure. I really enjoyed the interview today. I really hope the listeners really enjoy it. Have a great day. You too. In closing, here's a quick message. Coaching is the art of influence that underpins leadership in the 21st century. It is the very thing that can get you from being stuck to being extraordinary. So go to masterleadership.org and sign up to get a free coaching session. Until next time, continue to ignite that leader in you.